I think you're all about ready for church now. Amen? Yeah, so good to see y'all. You all excited about this series we're in? You doing good? Box of Bones is where we are. We are week seven today. Week number seven in. I got something special for you today. I believe God's going to bless your heart and bless your lives. If you're watching online right now, thank you for joining us. Please do share this with somebody because I believe God is speaking and there's somebody who needs this message besides just you. Amen. So we're going to get into it. We're going to get into it just a little bit. But I uh, got a quick question for you. I got a very, very serious, serious question for you before we get started. Okay? Serious question. Who here has an electric toothbrush? Okay, okay, okay. I thought it would be more of you. Okay, I thought it would be more of you. All right. Yeah, I, I, I remember. I remember when, when my wife and I went to electric. We thought we had finally come into the 21st century, you know. It was cool. It was awesome. It was nice. You know, we were keeping up with the cool kids. And then I found out like a little bit later on that I started going like 50-50 with my electric toothbrush versus my manual toothbrush. Anybody been there? Anybody understand that? No? Y'all are... So, so those of you who don't have electric toothbrush, because there are more of you than are us electric people, are you guys purists? You, you, you know what a purist is, right? People who just le like things pure, don't touch it, just leave it the way it is. Yeah? Anyway, so about 50% of the way, I found my, well, not 50% of the way, but a little bit later, I found myself just splitting my time, you know, 50% with the manual, 50% with the electric. And besides that, when I would use the electric, my wife was like, I don't think you're doing that right. Because while the toothbrush is there buzzing and spinning and working, I'm frantically brushing like I'm scraping paint off the wall. And she's like, I don't think you're supposed to be doing all this work because the toothbrush is doing all the work for you, right? Anybody been there? And I think it's kind of like that when we become Christians. We come into Christianity and we're not sure if we're supposed to be doing all the work. Is God supposed to be doing all the work? I don't really know. And uh, what tends to happen is we, we get confused sometimes and we don't know where that line is between what God's doing and what we're doing. Come on, can I get an amen on that? Yeah, because it happens, right? But let me just tell you, the answer to that is both are, in a sense, accurate. Because first off, God's already done all the work for your salvation, right? He's already done the buzzing and the spinning and all that through Jesus. Jesus died for us. There's nothing we could do about our own salvation. Jesus took care of that. But I'll tell you, though, after we meet Jesus, there is some daily brushing and flossing we need to do to maintain our spiritual life. And this is where I think a lot of Christians get it wrong, because now we feel like we could just kick back, relax, and let God do all the work. And God says, yeah, I already did all that work, but there's some stuff you need to do. You need to maintain Right? There's always, if you look throughout the Bible, there's a theme when it comes to maintenance. If, even if you go all the way back to Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve, right? He says, I've created a world for you that has everything you need, but you got to take care of it. You got to till the soil. You got to go and, and maintain the landscaping and all of these things, right? You don't just sit back and let the fruit just walk over from the tree and land in your mouth, right? You got to do something. And God said everything he created was what? Perfect. It was good. But we still had work to do. Church, we got work to do. And so today, I've titled my message, speaking of work, I've titled my message, Reviving Our Purpose. Reviving Our Purpose, because with our Box of Bones series, if you're just joining us for the first time, it's called, Revive, it's called Box of Bones, Reviving a Dead Faith. Reviving a Dead Faith. And so today, we're going to talk about reviving our purpose. Purpose. I think this is a good one because a lot of people, Christians and non-Christians alike, always have questions when it comes to purpose. What am I supposed to be doing? Why am I here? What am I created for? What's going on, right? There's a lot of, uh, we call these existential questions that we have that pertain to life and what life brings, what life is all about. God gives us a lot of really good information in his word. He gives us a lot of good clues. We're going to discover some of the things that the Bible has to say about this. For those of you who've been seeking and searching and wondering and praying and thinking, overthinking, really overthinking, I want to hopefully, you know, this message is going to be hopeful, helpful, and useful so that at the end of it, you're going to have some questions answered, right? Because it's legitimate questions we have. And let me just tell you, questions are okay. God's not freaked out by your questions, all right? It's not a lack of faith if you have questions. 
As a matter of fact, it shows how intentional you are about your Christianity if you have questions. So having a deep concern about things that matter is a good thing. It's not a bad thing, right? So we're going to hopefully answer some of those questions today. But I want to say this about purpose. Purpose gives us a sense of who we are and, and, and who we are created to be according to God's design, right? And so, of course, then it becomes that much more relevant to us to understand what those things are like. And I believe that, you know, um, that when we do answer these questions in ourselves, life can be a whole lot better for us, right? Uh, I, I think sometimes we stress out over the, the little things. You know, as they say, don't major in the minors, right? So don't make it a big problem when you don't have a question answered. Because with faith, with prayer, with coming to church to hear God speak through me and through whoever else is speaking, right? God is going to help answer a lot of the main questions for you. So just stay put. It's going to be all right. All right. So we're going to get ready for takeoff. You guys ready? Yes. Amen. Ready to take notes, take photos of the notes, whatever you're going to do. Ready to jump in? Let's do it. Father, thank you again for this moment, this time, this message. Thank you for this series. Thank you for these people. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to bring life to someone, Lord. And as we walk through our journey of life and we're constantly discovering and learning and asking questions, we are so grateful and thankful that you've created an environment, Lord God, where we can come and we can put a lot of these concerns to rest. I pray that today, Lord God, is of no exception. I pray that today you would speak clearly and boldly through me, Lord God, so that your people, Lord God, will receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said together, amen. 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 So having purpose is absolutely essential to life. Having purpose, absolutely essential to life. And you would be surprised how many things purpose is related to. Things you don't typically think about, right? But when it comes to a lot of our general health, especially mental health, Having purpose is directly linked to a lot of the things that we tend to go through in this life. And hopefully you'll, get, you'll begin to see how a lot of these connections are made. But I, will say a very, I want to say something that's a very bold statement, <clears throat> but it's a true statement. And it's this. We cannot truly know our purpose unless we know God. I'm going to say it again. We can't truly know our purpose in this earth, in this life, unless we know God. Because God is a God of purpose. God is a God who has set up your and my purposes. And if, unless we know him, who is the author, creator, and architect of our purpose, then we are going to be lost like a goose in a, in a hailstorm. And so I would venture to say that the very first step in the entire process is getting to know Christ. Amen. Now, I know most of you who are here and who are listening, you are already saved. So praise be to God, you're already two steps ahead of the, the game. But our purpose in life is directly tied to God's purpose. Let's look at Psalm 33, 11. I'm still in the NIV. I'll probably continue in the NIV straight through to the end of this uh, series just to, you know, help offset all the bad things I had to say about it. All right, Psalm 33, 11 says, but the plans of the Lord, the what? Plans. plans of the Lord stand firm, how long? Forever. And the, what's the next word? Purposes of his heart through all generations. So let's, let's break that down just a little bit. So God has plans? Yeah, so, so this is why we go back to the statement that we make. In order for us to accurately, truly know what our purpose is, we have to know God. Because God is a God of plans. He's also a God of purposes, right? So because he has purposes, he has made plans. So is God active or passive? Active. Some people believe God is some quiet little force. The ones who do believe he exists, some, some believe that he's, a quiet, he, he's a, a, a quiet force somewhere hidden away who just comes peeking out every now and then when things get a little crazy. But God is actively working out you and my purposes on a daily basis. Why? How do we know this? Because it, it ends by saying he does it what? Through all generations. Uh, that means you and me. 
as well as everybody else who has ever been created. God's will, purpose, and desire is to carry out his will in the earth through people. Through people. The Bible says in in some other place that he does nothing in the earth unless he first tells it to his prophets who are his servants. So God loves to partner with us even though he doesn't have to do it. God's God. He can do whatever he wants. He doesn't need assistance. He doesn't need help, right? He can do everything by himself. But he chooses to partner with us to get things done. That's good, that's good news. That's good news, right? And so his desire is to enact his purpose in the earth with us and through us. I remember when I first got saved as a young man, I remember thinking to myself, oh, this is cool. Now God's going to give me everything I want. And I know a lot of people come to faith like that, right? And then as I grew and mature and started to learn about the Lord and started to read my Bible and discover what it actually says, then that thinking kind of changed. The thinking now moved to, okay, now that I'm saved, God's going to use me to do what he wants. Right? It's a change of perspective. Why? Because he has purposes that he needs to carry out in this earth. And it's one of the great misconceptions of Christianity today that people believe that they come to faith so that God can work out their plan instead of them being involved in his plan. And you know what? You can't really blame a lot of people, right? Because some of this stuff comes from preachers who are just like you as car salesmen. Right? They preach the gospel like, like, like the guy who says, you really need this Ford Ranger. It has a lot of heritage. It's going to keep you safe on the road. You can go off-roading. You can have great family vacations. It's great. You really need to have this car. And then we think that it's all about us and our benefit and what we're going to get. Now, do we benefit from Christianity? 100%. But it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about any of us. It's about God And his desire, we belong to him. He doesn't belong to us. And I think we need to correct, we need to course correct where we've gone wrong for so long. And so we've been trained to think, just like everywhere else, that everything is always about us. And that's a dangerous way of thinking, right? And so what ends up happening when we have that line of thinking is wherever we go, we think that everybody is there at our beck and call. You're here to serve me. You're here to work at my pleasure. But the last time I checked, God's called us to serve other people. We are called to be... Matter of fact, Jesus himself was the ultimate servant. Right? The Bible even says that. That he didn't come to be served. He came to serve. That's crazy awesome. Right? And so there go we who are followers of Christ. We now need to adopt that same attitude and, and discover that... Life ain't about me. It's always about somebody else. If you go all the way back to the Old Testament, there were Old Testament laws. Let me just teach you something real quick. Every single Old Testament law is there for a reason. A lot of it is not meant for us to adopt today, right? Some of it is, some of it's not. And a little, bit, a little hint on that is the things that are mentioned specifically as, as God's ethic, ethic, ethic laws, ethical laws, And moral laws, those last forever because the Bible states it in other places that this is what you shall do, this is what you shall not do. Now, minus that, there are other things that were only meant for Israel. It was only meant for them, their culture, their climate, their time, right? And it's not meant for us to be uh, uh, prescriptive. It's meant to be descriptive. It's just describing something. It's not a prescription of what we ought to do today. One of the things, and, and let me just say one more thing on that, right? When you look at Scripture, we have to understand that Scripture sometimes uh, teaches us a principle. And once we understand the principle, the method can vary. Okay? We don't, because we we call methodology doing things a certain way. But sometimes methodology can lead to methodolatry. Kind of like adultery. Methodolatry. Which means that we are worshiping the way you do something more than understanding why you're doing it. Make sense? And so one of the things that they did in the Old Testament, what God commanded them to do, they said, listen, when you glean from your crops, when you go to gather in your harvest, leave some behind so that those who are less fortunate could come and partake. 
right? So what is he teaching us? To share, to be selfless, to give to other people. And throughout the Bible, we see one common theme that we have to do two things. Love God and love other people. Why is that important for us to talk about in 2022, pastor? Because we're taught to live the American dream, which can sometimes mean the American greed. And it can sometimes be all about me, baby. And if I got to step on someone's head to get what I need to, then I'll do that. And that is not what God teaches us to do. Amen? Now, that was a little bit of a rabbit trail, but that was for somebody, so take it. You're welcome. Keep the change. So I want to give you seven purposes or seven things that purpose gives us. I know we just talked about it's all about God, but we do benefit as well, right? So I want to give you seven benefits to purpose that we can take back with us, right? Let's go with the first one. The first benefit of purpose is peace. Peace. If you want to see somebody who is miserable, I'll show you somebody, or if you show me somebody miserable, I'll show you somebody who has no purpose in life. No purpose. Don't know what I'm doing. Don't know what I'm here for. Don't know what life is all about. That's a miserable person. That's a person without peace. Because let's face it, there's nothing worse than not knowing what the heck is going on. Everybody ever been in an environment like that? Like you walk into like a new situation and you don't know left from right, like who's doing what and who's in charge and what am I doing? What's my little part that I play in all of this? A lot of people live life like that. They don't understand anything. Why? Because they don't have the fundamentals of why they're here. This book answers those questions for us. And how many of you have seen very talented, gifted people who have a lot of potential do dumb things? Just ruin their lives doing stupidness, right? Why? Because some of them literally don't understand what their purpose is. That God gave you those gifts, those talents, those abilities for good, for reasons. Because we can use what we have for good or we can use it for evil. And if we understand why we have it and where it fits in the whole framework of life, then we will use it for what it's intended for. So knowing God leads to purpose. Knowing purpose leads to peace. Why? Because our existence makes sense. Our existence makes sense. We're all trying to make sense of our existence. And the Bible is the only document on earth that makes sense of life. This. This is the only thing on earth that makes sense of life. Amen. I, I, I seriously can't imagine how atheists live. I mean, if you, if you are more Dar- Darwinian and you believe in evolution and all that nonsense, you, you believe that we came from monkeys, for one. And you think that, you know, we're, we're all originally, you know, a clump of matter that will exist today and not exist after you die. And then that's it. And there's nothing to look forward to. There's no life. They have to be among the most miserable people in the world. Because there's no hope for a future, Right? And so when you go down that line of thinking, then life just has no meaning. If you believe that there is no God, then you have no moral, no moral principles. You can't claim that murder is wrong. Because what's your evidence if you don't believe there is a God? The only reason we know murder is wrong is because the Bible tells me so. Because there's a God who said, murder is wrong. Which is why you have a lot of abortionists that are, that are yelling and fighting for the right to kill babies. Because they don't believe that there is a God who exists. And once you don't believe that, then the floodgates are now open to doing whatever the heck people want to do. Sorry, did I go there again? All right. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17 says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though inwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us what? An eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we who are believers have faith and hope in a future eternal glory. Eternal means forever. Forever, right? We are people who are hopeful. Amen. 
Hope brings peace because we have something to look forward to when this life is over. But for now, peace has its place in helping us fulfill our purpose. Because how many of you know the more peaceful you are, the, the better you can carry out whatever you're doing? How many of you have ever tried to accomplish something under great duress? Now, I know some of you, you, you work better under pressure, right? Who here works great under pressure? Okay, so you guys are the people who wait till the very last minute to get things done. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. And that's your reason. You're like, I work better under pressure. No, just do it a little earlier. I, I, don't feel bad. No shame in the game. I'm one of those people, too. I have, I have to to train myself and learn to get things started a little bit sooner, right? But yeah, there's something about that. But I will tell you, though, that when you are peaceful, then you can carry out your task that much better. So my question to you, church, is do you have peace knowing what your purpose is? Do you have peace knowing what your purpose is? Or are you not yet peaceful because you're still trying to figure it out? Well, let me just say this to you. I want to say this to you. God's desire is for you to know what your purpose is. He wouldn't give you a purpose and then have it all smoke and mirrors and all, you know, hidden away from you. So as you ask the Lord and as you pray and as you walk through your relationship with him, he will reveal his purpose for your life to you. Amen? And then number two, purpose brings passion. I think a lot of people suffer from a lack of passion. And all the wives said, <laughs> watch it. Don't get in trouble. So we all look for things to get excited about, right? We like passion. We like passion. We try to find ways to get passion. Where are my sports people at? Where are my sports people? Yeah, you guys are like the knuckleheadedness of, of all. I know that's not a word. It is now. Y- y'all are just crazy, man. I- I'm not really a sports guy, but I've been in sports situations, and, and y'all, y'all, y'all just have lost y'all minds. But I understand, though, because we all are passionate about something, right? You know, for some of y'all, y'all, because I've seen y'all Instagrams and stuff. I see y'all. Y'all into hiking and biking and other things I'm not liking. <laughs> and, and let me just say, there was a time, though, when, when, when I was into that stuff. You know, I was in my 20s. But now, you know, we're in grandbaby stage, so we're passionate about going to the thrift store. <laughs> hey, don't judge, okay? You, you're going to be 50-something one day, and, and I want to see what you're passionate about, you know? Uh, but I, I'll tell you, we especially like thrifting like when you're in a new city, and you went some, going somewhere for the first time, and you get to, you know, uncover those little treasures, Hey, I'm going to be super spiritual on y'all right now. It's a form of redemption. You're taking something that's been discarded and thrown off, and you're giving it new life, and you're redeeming it. Yeah, yeah. See, I tell you, us preachers are like used car salesmen. Anyhow, where are we at? So knowing your purpose gives you passion because once you are engaged in what you know you are supposed to do, there is a level of passion that comes with that. I'm telling you right now. Now, as a new believer, you have to work that out. That's a process. You're still trying to figure out what's going on. You're trying to get navigation going, right? You're like, okay, Lord, what's up? But once you know what you're doing, oh, man, it gets exciting from there because you're focused. And some of you, once you're laser focused on something, you do your best work, yeah. right? You just need something to be focused on. And, and again, I will, I will bring up the, the knuckleheaded people who, who are super talented and who do dumb things. I will tell you right now, they will make the best Christians if they only understood their passion. <clears throat> because by nature, they're working something. They're just working the wrong somethings. You know, it's like the Apostle Paul. When he was Saul, he was busy murdering Christians. But he was busy and he was passionate. And God had to say, okay, I'm going to keep you with the passion. I'm not going to take the passion from you, but I'm going to change your mission. The mission is going to change. The passion is going to stay the same because I'm the one who gave you the passion. And then it was on. He wrote two-thirds of this New Testament. He was one of the greatest, you know, men of God that ever lived and did incredibly amazing work. Uh, for which we are the beneficiaries today. Amen? So God's purposely built passion into us as the engine 
that, that, that pushes us along in getting what we need to get done done. That passion. Because if you're not passionate, let's just face it, you ain't going to do it. Because you're going to say, it's boring. I feel forced to do it. I don't like this. It's not my wheelhouse. But passion makes the difference. Romans 12, 11 and 12. This was Paul's admonition, ad- admonition rather, to the Roman church. He says, never be lacking in zeal, which is another word for passion. But keep your spiritual fervor while serving the Lord. So what he was, what he was saying is sometimes you have to encourage yourself to continue to be passionate. God gives you the passion, but sometimes you got to continue to be passionate. Remind yourself that this is exciting work. This is great. This is going to benefit other people. Excuse me. And this is going to bring God glory. Amen. And the passionate we are, the more passionate we are about things, the more we're going to get things done. So let me ask you, are you passionate about serving Jesus or are you still trying to find that passion? I don't know where you are in that whole scheme of things today. But guess what? If you don't have passion today, God can give you passion. God's going to give you passion. You just need to know that it's his desire before it's your desire, and he will give that to you. Just walk with him. You know, when the Bible talks about us walking by faith, it encompasses all of these things. The stuff you don't know, the stuff you don't understand. Faith says, Lord, I trust you that eventually at some point I'm going to get the information that I need. Amen? And then there's number three. Purpose brings, gives a defense against distraction. Okay, let's be honest. Who here is easily distracted? Yeah, some of y'all distracted right now. See, you were busy looking at your phones and not answering the question. <laughs> so we have a problem when it comes to keeping our attention focused on what we need to keep our attention focused on. And when we are passionate and we have purpose, that helps as a defense mechanism against distraction. Right? You know, uh, growing up, they said, what, idle hands are the devil's workshop? Right? Right? And of course, we know this. If you don't have something to do, which is why our parents and grandparents gave us a lot of chores. Because they know the minute you don't have something to do, you're going to find something to do. And the something you find to do is not going to be good. Because that's just the way it is, right? So having a purpose, which really means a reason for living, helps us defend against things that are not intended for us. Now, I will give an example. Now, we didn't have this growing up. But you modern day parents, you know what this is like. So let's just say you're going on a long road trip. Or maybe not a road trip like out of town. You're just going to be in the car for a while. And you got the little toddler in the back seat. What do we do? What do we do, parents? What do we give them? iPad, iPhone, tablet, entertainment, something to keep them what? Entertained. Keep them distracted so that they don't understand that a little human isn't supposed to be sitting in a car seat for 12 hours, right? And so it's kind of like that with, with, with uh, our purpose, but better. It's better than entertainment, right? It keeps us focused on the things that we, we need to be focused on. I will tell you, in the Bible, Jesus visits the home, uh, 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 the home of some of his friends. And in that home, there were two sisters. One of the sisters was completely focused on Jesus, worshiping. Focus in his presence, at his feet. The other sister, distracted, doing chores, housework, doing stuff. And they represent, I think, the two types of Christians that we have today. Some are distracted and some are focused. Let's just read it real quick since you don't believe me. It's Luke 10, 38 to 42. Just because you all like evidence. You all like, must be detectives or something. Luke 10, 38 to 42. It says... As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Where was Mary? Doing what? Listening to what he said. Worshiping. Yes. It says, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Let me pause here for a minute. Because, see, this type of Christian who is distracted, they're going to tell you, I'm not distracted. I'm doing the Lord's work. Because what was she doing? Preparing. 
preparing the meal, preparing the house, making sure everything smells nice, candles lit, right? All the good stuff. But God is saying, even though we can have this appearance as though we are busy working for the Lord, sometimes we are distracted from the most important thing, which is stopping what you're doing and sitting at the feet of Jesus and getting in his presence. But when we understand our purpose, then we can avoid distraction. And we can say, okay, Lord, we know that all these other things may be important. They have their place, but I'm laser focused. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know when I'm supposed to do it, and I'm on it. Amen. So which are you? Are you Mary or are you Martha? And if you're Martha, God has a word for you. Get out the kitchen. Amen. All right, number four. Purpose causes engagement with God. So it's similar to three, but better. It causes engagement with God. Some of you are starters. Who here likes to start things? Okay. Who here are my finishers? Okay, so you're the ones that have to come along after those starters start something and didn't finish it. And you'll be like, all right, I guess I'll clean it up then. But some people are great starters, some people are great finishers, but I will tell you that what we need is to be both starters and finishers. We need to complete what we started, but we need an engagement with God so that we can get our purpose moving. Amen. And purpose helps us to do that. Because sometimes we feel like, well, I don't have a reason to pray. I don't have a reason to really have Bible study time and stuff like that. But once we understand what our purpose is, then Bible study makes sense. Suddenly it doesn't feel like a chore anymore. And it's like, you know what? I just want to get to know God more. I want to understand what he has to say about this. I want to know what God's heart is concerning a matter, right? Or I want to pray today. I just want to go just spend some time with the Lord because, you know, I I need some clarity about this. Or I need some direction. Or I need some comfort. Or I need some peace, right? Why? Because of purpose. Because once we see that God has given us an assignment, then we suddenly realize that we need help with that assignment. And so we go to God to get the help we need with the assignment that he's given us. It's all about engagement. God loves engagement. He never just says, hey, go do it, and then he just closes the door. No. He says go do it, but he leaves the door open. And he says, as you need, just come to me. I'm here. I'm here for you, right? That's the God we serve. And the more we need him, the more we will engage with him. Some of you, God has purposely set for you some things that you have to walk through right now. It's hard. It's tough. Some troubling things. Don't be dismayed. It's not meant to kill you. God just wants you to engage with him. What he's showing you is that life is bigger than you. Things are bigger than you. Things can swallow you up easily if you don't have him there to decide whether you live or die, right? But bigger than that, what he wants you to know is that he loves you and that he's there for you and he wants you to engage with him and conversate with him and fellowship with him, right? And to walk with him daily, by the minute, by the second. Always be thinking about him and including him and involving him in everything you do. But what we tend to do is sometimes when things go really bad, then we want to run to God and say, Lord, I think I'm in trouble. But if we have a lifestyle of engaging with the Lord, healthy prayer life, staying in the Word of God, studying our Bibles, fellowshipping with other believers, right? Then we're already in that fellowship with Him. When things go crazy, you're already there. You don't have to go from zero to 60. Amen. And so when you know your purpose, it encourages partnership with the Lord. I I remember before living for Jesus, I had a purpose. But my purpose was to drink as much fun juice as I could, party as hard as I could, stay out as late as I could, hang out with all the friends I could. That was my purpose. That was my purpose. And I, I thought it was awesome. It was, it was living life, right? Or so I thought. And then, of course, when I got serious for the Lord, everything changed. 
everything changed. My entire purpose, mission, calling, everything was absolutely different. And you know what it reminds me of? It kind of reminds me of this whole engagement thing. It reminds me of y'all. You know when you started dating your love of your life? You remember those days? Yeah. Four o'clock in the morning, the sun's now coming up, and you're there like, you hang up first. No, 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 you hang up first. No, you hang up first. You hung up? Oh, no, you're still there. You remember those days, right? It's engagement, and this is what God wants. He wants you to be thinking about him and spending every waking moment with him. But some of us have lost that, which is why we got to revive these things, right? When we were first saved, man, we were in love. You know, one of the condemnations against one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation is the fact that it's the church of Philadelphia. Why? You've lost your first love. Go back to the passion you used to have. You remember when we were dating? This is what God is saying. You remember when we were dating? There were flowers and chocolate. You know, what, what happened now? You barely get a good morning. Right? You know, you come over there with your teeth in, brush, your stinky breath. But what's for breakfast? And God said, how about you make me some breakfast for once? Oh, I'm sorry, am I, am I going into other? Anyway. No, we have a great marriage. Just don't worry about it. But I'm telling you, man, we have to get our passion together and understand that engagement is what God wants. God wants to know you. He wants to live in a life of intimacy with you. You know God invented the word intimacy? We didn't come up with that. God invented that. Because the intimacy we have as husband and wives, husbands and wives, is a reflection of the intimacy that we should have with Jesus. That's why Jesus refers to the church as his bride, right? So our marriages should be a reflection of our relationship with God. So purpose, purpose encourages engagement with God. Number five, you guys okay so far? Need, need water or anything? No, if you're taking pills, it's uh, 1120. Okay, number five, a life mission. Purpose gives us a life mission. Everybody needs a mission. Now, you don't have to literally write a mission statement, but I know some of you nerds, you might want to do that. So it's okay if it'll help. Write a mission statement, but we all need a mission in life. Something that we know we are living for. I like to call it my life's work. My life's work. The reason, the overarching reason why I was created, right? We need that. Excuse me. And when we don't take God's, we create and invent our own. That's, what, that's just what happens. Why does that happen, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Because we're wired that way. We're wired for mission. So when we're off mission and we, cre we create our own mission, and it's quite often a very bad mission, but we're on one. And also having a mission answers the big question that everybody likes to ask, why am I here? What's the meaning of life? The number one Googled question in the history of the internet is what's the meaning of life? Everybody wants to know why am I here, right? It's the most existential question. And let me give you a couple of things that the Bible tells us in answer to that question. You guys want to know what God has to say about it? Yeah. Totally, man, totally. All right, number one, we're here to bring God glory, yeah. not to bring ourselves prosperity. All right, Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone who was called by my name, God speaking through the prophet Isaiah, this is what prophets did. Let me just, teaching moment. Teaching moment? Let me parenthetically insert real quick. Okay, so what you have to understand about prophecy, some scriptures are called prophecy. There are four, what they call major prophets, and there are 12 minor prophets, right? These are books of the Bible, Old Testament. The 12 minor prophets are the last 12 books of the Old Testament. The minor prophets are not less important than the major prophets. They're only called minor prophets because the books are smaller. Okay? So the four major prophets are Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah. Right? You with me so far? Okay. So a lot of people tend to think that the word prophecy only refers to speaking about future events, prophesying future events. But that's only one connotation of prophecy in the Old Testament. Can I tell you it's not the prominent meaning of prophecy? Did you know that? 
The Old Testament prophets, their primary job was not speaking future events. It was a part of it. But the major connotation of the word prophecy means to proclaim something. It's a proclamation. So this is an example of a proclamation. So what they were, were they were spokesmen for God. So this is often why they would say things that sounded like God was saying for him, uh, was speaking himself. So he said, everyone who was called by my name, this is Isaiah speaking, but he didn't mean by my Isaiah. Got it? He meant God. He was speaking for God. Whom I created, why? For my glory, whom I formed and made. So why were we created? For God's glory. How do we live? For our glory. How do I look in this dress? Okay, Romans eleven thirty six. For from him and through him and for him are all things. And to him be what? How long? Who does the glory belong to? For how long? Who does the glory belong to? For how long? Forever. We were created for his glory. Number two, to proclaim his praise. Not to praise ourselves. Let's go back to Isaiah again, 43, 21. It says, the people I formed for myself that they may do what? Proclaim my praise. So we're, we're called to proclaim God's praise. The language that comes out of a Christian should always be in glory and honor of God, to praise his name. To praise means to speak highly of, right? To speak highly of our God. Why? Because he's good, gracious, merciful, kind, died for us. My God, you don't get any better than that. Amen. Let's look at also uh, 1 Peter 2, 9. It says, but you are a chosen people. So first off, God chose us, a royal priesthood, holy nation, God's special possession. Again, let me just insert, God was speaking to the nation of Israel. And if you ever wondered, well, why does God favor Israel over everybody else? Isn't that favoritism? No, and I'll tell you why. Because we today are a representation of the nation of Israel. So what God was showing in, in his love for Israel, because remember, in the New Covenant, New Testament, we now get all the benefits of God's people. We are all a part of God's family. So everything that you see in, 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 as far as God's relationship and his affection and love toward Israel, all of that now belongs to us. Okay, let's get back on track. So you, chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, God's special possession, that you might do what? Declare the praises of him who calls you out of darkness into his wonderful light. What are we supposed to be doing, people? Telling people that God brought us out of darkness into light. Say, you will be surprised what God did for me. This is going to blow your mind. Amen. Okay, number three. We were created to do good work. Now, we should know this, right? We do not work for our salvation. We work from our salvation. So we are still required to do good work, but the work doesn't start with us and our ability. It starts with our faith in God, and faith in God means that he comes and empowers us to live out our Christian life. So it's out of our salvation that we work. It's not for our salvation that we work. You guys got that? Yeah. All right. Uh, Ephesians 2, verse 10. Since y'all always want scripture and all. It says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ for what? You got to shout it like you mean it. To do good work. To do good work. So uh, you're trying to tell me now, uh, Pastor... Uh, we're supposed to be like uh, producing something? Yes. And if you want clarity on it, the Bible talks about the nine fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Right? That's a part of what we produce. Good work. 
A Christian should never be the one on the job with the bad reputation. The Christian should never be the one who there's a complaint about who's always late, who's bad with the clients, who's unwilling to help, who's not a team player, who's hard to work with, difficult to be around. That should never be. Now, as a Christian, sometimes people will lie on you. They will lie about you and they will defame you and stuff. And that's fine because God said that that stuff's going to happen. I'm talking about stuff we cause ourselves. Right? We are supposed to produce good work. Why? Because we have Christ in us who is literally transforming our lives on a daily basis. Man, that was so good I got saved all over again just saying it. And you need to know this too. God is the one who chose the time and place that you would be born in history. Right? Why? Because he is the God over both history and geography. He made it all. He doesn't exist in time. He exists in eternity. Time was created for us. Which is why we have a hard time understanding eternity and we get a headache when we try to think of what everlasting or eternity is. We, we get a brain fog, right? Because we don't know what that is. God knows what that is. Because the Bible says he's always existed and he always will exist. But he chose the date the time and the place that you would be born in this earth. That should tell you something when it comes to your purpose. If he's already planned that out, then don't you think that he's already figured out how your mission's supposed to work? Amen. He's already done all the thinking for you. We don't have to think about things that we think we have to think about. You know that? And sometimes we stress ourselves over trying to do God's job. God says, I already did that part. Just accept what I say by faith. Just walk with me here. I got you, man. Amen. So knowing God's purpose for us helps us to live out our life's mission, even though they are the overarching reason why we were created is to bring God glory. He also shows us very practical things that we can do to live out our faith in our mission work. He shows us practically what that means. Because I know some of you are like, you're looking for that golden moment. Like, yeah, I, I do those things. I live for Christ. I have faith. I, all that's, I share my testimony. But I still feel like there's something else that I'm supposed to be doing. Anybody feel that way? No? You guys already got it figured out? Oh, you don't have it figured out. Okay. See? Distracted again. But let me just tell you, when you walk with the Lord, he will show you what that is. I, I know I ran. You all know my story. I ran into mine uh, by no intention of my, of my own. I, I was in banking and finance, working as a banker, had a 16-year career, finally gave my heart back to the Lord, was serious about him, and just on my job, God opened up doors for me to talk to people about faith. Of course, I had to be careful not to, you know, use my boss's time to share faith, but the opportunity arose when people came in for a loan, you know. They would come in sometimes weeping and crying, oh, what's going on? And then they share something personal, opened up an opportunity. And this went on for a while. What I did not know was God was training me to be a pastor, to be compassionate about people, learn to listen, learn to, you know, uh, help, pray for people, all that stuff. And eventually I found out he was sending me off to Bible college with my beautiful wife and that we were going to plant a church. But how did it happen? Step by step. One thing at a time, right? And I didn't have to do anything to force it. This is what you need to know. If it's God's plan, we don't have to force it. I, I know some Christians who are frantically trying to scratch around to figure out what they're called to do. It's not, that's not the way it works. If it's God's plan, he has no problem letting you know what it is. Amen? And you're going to get there. You just stay faithful to him. That's the key. It's faithfulness. You hear that? Faithfulness. At the time, you know what I was doing? I was serving my church. Serving my pastor. And even after God said, you guys are going to go to Bible school and you're going to, you know, go into full-time ministry. You know what I still did in the meantime while we waited? Because there was a year wait before we left. Serve my church. God said, leave your job. Trust me by faith for 12 months before you go. So I woke up early every morning, went to church. What do you need me to do, pastor? I cut the grass, 
vacuum the floors, clean the toilets, right? And I had a lot of fun doing it. Why? Because I was on mission. I didn't wait till I went to Bible college and graduated and then, oh, now I'm on mission. No, the mission starts in our hearts. The mission starts the moment we know that we're working for God. That's when the passion started. That's when the mission started. That's when I got excited. Amen. And then number six, consistency. Purpose gives us consistency. So it gives us a mission, but it keeps us on mission. How many of you know starting something's one thing, staying faithful to it is something completely different, right? Let's go in back to you starters, right? Sometimes we can start something, oh yeah. But how about we last through it? And one of the things that purpose gives us is the ability to stay consistent. And it keeps us focused when things get cray-cray. Because you guys know, there are, there are a plethora of things in the world today that can keep us distracted, unfocused, get us off kilter. And we need to stay focused. And speaking of consistency, uh, two years ago, my wife and I went 100% plant-based. <laughs> it was awesome. I mean, we, we, we were strict, you know. And, and we weren't like fun plant-based. We were like serious plant-based. That means no oils. You know, we try we cook with, you know, water and not oil and it's just to keep it healthy. You know what I mean? The extreme. We did it for a year and a half solid. I mean, no looking back, you know? It was it was crazy. It was awesome. But then I got bored. And I was very very excited when my doctor said, "You should incorporate fish and lamb into your." I'm like, "Yes!" Fish and lamb, the two things that, Je- that are all about Jesus. Jesus cooked fish and Jesus was the lamb of God. So we're going to do, do fish and lamb. That's godly. That's biblical. And so that went on okay for a while until I wanted more. And, and, and I decided, because statistics says, that in, in order for you to be more consistent in your plant-based diet, it's good to take breaks every now and then. You know, statistics. So we're going to go with so, so So I decided that once a week I'll, ha- I'll have a cheat day. You know, once a week, once a week. But see, the problem is it was a better idea in my head than, than it actually was living it out. You know, because a little bit of pork and chicken and beef in, it was a little, it was a little disappointing, right? And I, and I quickly realized that something was wrong here. <laughs> Three things happened. Number one, I had disappointment, which means it didn't live up to what I thought it would be. So I was immediately disappointed. How many of you are like that? Stuff looks good. It's well advertised. You drive past that billboard. It's like, ooh, right? You know. You don't eat KFC, but just because the billboard got the kernel with that crispy. Anyway, you see, you're all thinking about food now. Stay focused. Number two, I had regret, which is knowing for sure that I'm doing something that I know I shouldn't be doing. And you know what number three was? Number three was, I had an appreciation for what the mission was in the first place. Because with the mission, I dropped 30 pounds. I was eating clean and healthy. I moved from a size medium to an extra small. So I was healthy, my blood pressure was down, my doctor took me off of all my high blood pressure meds and, and all that stuff, and I was great. I put a little bit back on, though. But I'm working on it. I got 10 more pounds to go. But stop judging. But it's like that with sin, right? Sometimes as a believer, we think that we can just, you know, I miss the old stuff. And it's better in our heads than it actually is when we live it out. And the minute we start dibbling and dabbling and we become inconsistent in what God's called us to do, you know what happens? Those same three things. Disappointment, regret, and we have an appreciation for the new mission that we're on with Christ. So hopefully this message is going to be preventative for some of you who've been contemplating some stuff. And God said, ain't worth it. Ain't worth it. Because when you're laying there with your bloated stomach, and you got to make more trips to the restroom than you had planned on. You're going to appreciate the avocado and the bean patties instead of the, oh, God. 
Anyway, <laughs> let's stay focused. So having a sense of purpose keeps us on mission. And then finally, number seven is purpose gives us a sense of accomplishment. A sense of accomplishment. God's built something into the human brain where we release what's called dopamine. And one of the ways we get dopamine is when we accomplish something. It's having that satisfaction when we actually got something done. Some of y'all could use some dopamine in your lives because you got some stuff you've been putting off, you got to go do it, right? You procrastinators. That's the ones I'm talking. Anyway, so what is happening here is once we're on mission, we stay on mission, and we begin to walk out the purpose that God has for our lives, there is something soothing and satisfactory about that. God's built it that way. And let me just say, the satisfaction is not going to, it's not going to just be at the end of your life. You know, like Paul who said, I've, I've fought a good fight, I've ran the race, I've done great things, and now I can go home to be the Lord. I'm talking about even before that. You can begin to appreciate that from moment to moment. It's a gradual process. Matter of fact, it's healthy to accomplish things gradually than trying to wait for the big thing down the road, right? Use wisdom. Pace yourself. It's a marathon, not a sprint, right? God will be with you to walk you through the little steps of life. Take every day, one day at a time. I know I sound like a a self-help book right now, but these these are true things. Don't grab on, try to grab onto the whole thing at once and try to run with it. No, take it in small doses. That's the key to longevity. Small, consistent doses. And God will be with you. He will walk with you. And each step, you're going to feel the sense of joy and satisfaction. And then you accomplish another little step, a sense of joy and satisfaction. And on and on it goes. And then you will understand what consistency is. But a lot of us, we try to take on too much at once. It fails miserably. And then we get discouraged. And we're like, well, this Christian thing ain't working. No, we just have to just be patient. Calm down. It's going to be all right. One step at a time. And when you fail, because you will, don't stay there. Know that God's forgiven you. He's forgiven you. He knew you were going to fail before he saved your life. He didn't say, oh, no, this one can't be a Christian. They're going to sin tonight at 4 o'clock. No. Listen, God knows all that. But he saved you anyway. So when you sin, fess up. And get back on. Keep moving. Ask God to forgive you. Be repentant. Don't be arrogant about your sin. Don't make excuses for it. Cover it up. Hide it. Pretend it didn't exist. Adam did that. What did that get him? Kicked out the garden. Naked. Hiding with leaves. You you get the point. No. Fess up. Lord, I, 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 I sinned against you. I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Amen. And God says, God, the Bible declares that God's going to save you, heal you, restore you back to fellowship with him. That's how it works. So landing the plane, what does this mean practically? Start with prayer. Prayerfully ask God to help. Prayerfully ask God to help. Lord, I need to know my purpose. I need to know practically what that means. And just trust him that he's going to answer you, right? Right? Because you want to, number one, know what the big mission is. And you're going, to, you're going to get that. But here's the other more important one. Ask him to help you develop healthy habits, practices, and routines. The overall, general, large-scale, macro health of your Christian life boils down to the small, incremental things. Daily practices, habits, and routines. The little things, not the big things. And once we can master those things, and you're not going to always get it right. For some of you, it'll only act as a guideline for you. Like you're going to say, let me give an example. You're going to say, okay, I'm going to wake up at 6 a.m. every morning, and I'm going to pray for 45 minutes, and then I'm going to have my... No, okay, so you might wake up at 8 o'clock, And you might pray for 10 minutes, and that might happen for four days. 
But you know what? It's more prayer that you've prayed in all your life. So start there, right? And then incrementally move along. Again, God is patient. We have to learn patience. But he will help you develop those routines. And before you know it, you will grow into the waking up at 6 a.m. and spending an hour in prayer or whatever. Not that an hour in prayer has to be a goal. Let me just say that. Right? We're not legalists. Nobody says that an hour prayer is more sanctified than a 10-minute one. The Bible doesn't teach you that. What the Bible teaches is, remember, there's principle and then there's methodology. Remember we said that? What's the principle? Talk to God. That's the principle. Now, if your thing is an hour, do your thing. If your thing is 10 minutes, you can have a robust, meaningful 10 minutes with God. That can be more powerful than an hour. Because after, you know, your short attention span, after 30 minutes, you're sleeping anyway. Right? So avoid being legalistic. Avoid being legalistic. Understand that God is going to walk with you through this process to enact his purpose in your life. It's his plan, not yours. He is more invested in it than you are. He's the one that died on the cross, not you. So he wants to see you succeed. Amen. So that should take a lot of pressure off you. Amen. Everybody good? All right, I want to pray for you. Before we leave this place today. Father, thank you so much for Always reminding us of how good you are and how much you are here for us with whatever it is that we need. Thank you, Father, for the reassurances that you do the heavy lifting in life and that we don't have to stress and worry and be anxious about things that we typically get caught off guard with. And so help us, Lord, to formulate, Lord, this, this, this idea that God is with me God is working through me, God is for me, and that going forward, I don't have to stress. And so I'm asking you right now, Father, to have your way in the lives of these people. I pray, God, that you would begin to lift the burdens off of them. Take away from them, Lord, this idea that they have to outwork everybody else just to gain your approval. But let them know that they've already been approved by you because they bear the blood of Jesus. And help us with our routines, our daily habits, our practices, our schedules, the things that we formulate, the things we do on a regular and a daily basis. Help us, Lord, to have good, meaningful, healthy practices in this lifetime and that we can grow into the people we need to be. And let our mission in life, our purposes, be absolutely crystal clear. And we thank you for it right now. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everyone said together. Amen.